Hi, I'm Sean Bice. I lead databases here at Amazon. I believe every customer can use data to build a foundation for future innovation. I believe many things start and end with data. Data is a foundational component of an application and many systems. And while it's not possible to reason every single contingency that could happen down the road, it is possible to have a strong data foundation to prepare for that. And with a strong foundation, you stand the best chance to overcome the unexpected and innovate in new ways. That is why I'm here with all of you today. When we think about things that have gone through a significant transition, such as personal banking, do you remember when you had to go to the bank? Driving to the bank, parking, walking in, standing in line, filling out that deposit slip, endorsing the check, handing that to the teller to immediately cash a check? For some of us, that is the way things used to be and systems were built in a way to accommodate that type of banking. I remember the iPhone launching in 2007, and as consumers raced to get one, developers raced to build new apps, but in a different way. What we were used to was suddenly flipped on its head and new possibilities emerged. But I also remember back then people saying things like, no way, Will I ever deposit a check with my phone? Today, consumers can do personal banking almost entirely from the palm of a hand. And try to imagine the banks that saw this first, embraced the change, and built entirely new experiences for their customers. Also, try to imagine the banks that ignored this and stuck with familiarity regarding how to do things. Let me draw a parallel to the transition from on-premises to cloud computing. When we think about other things that have gone through a significant transition, such as application architectures, remember when it could take months to get hardware before being able to experiment with an idea? And when building a monolith application sounded easy, but over time it became so intermingled it couldn't be easily serviced or scaled? In those moments when a server was accidentally unplugged and then having to explain that in the meeting, none of us want to attend. Remember when getting something like infrastructure sizing wrong could delay a project by months? Or carefully inspecting expansion slots on system boards to give you an idea of future extensibility? Or how about Understanding disk spindles as a way of gauging read-write performance because switching out storage could be a major undertaking. Or the tedious process of building server racks, rail systems, cabling systems, and realizing you don't have enough cage parts at the end. Or how about writing numerous installation scripts to build out complete stacks and having to deal with the nuance of everything that can go wrong. With all this undifferentiated heavy lifting to manage, it's hard to experiment and innovate quickly. Let's look at how the cloud has flipped all of this on its head. Fully managed APIs is like having total control of the cloud in the palm of your hand. Where from a command line, I can create a test instance in the matter of seconds. And when I'm ready to transition into production, I can easily modify an instance to a larger computing environment. I can even provision a multi-AZ environment where the system creates a primary database instance and synchronously replicates that data to a standby instance in a different availability zone. I can change storage to provisioned IOPS for greater performance. And I can even establish the backup retention policy with a parameter change. And when a new core architecture like AWS Graviton that promises up to 40% price performance savings is available, I can switch to this in a simple command. That is the power of fully managed APIs. And why many who build for the full power of the cloud have application architectures that look like this. 
With fully managed APIs, builders don't have to deal with all the muck from the old way of doing things. This means you can break applications down into smaller parts, think about the workload and its access pattern, and pick the right tool for the right job. As a result, developers don't need to trade off functionality performance and scale. In the old world, things were so difficult to set up and manage. Developers were often forced to deploy too much onto a single database management system. That is not the world we live in anymore. Let me share a tale of two customers with different foundations. Since COVID, I've had numerous conversations with customers who are still working with dated infrastructures. They're blocked by basics such as not being able to reduce costs or to support sudden order of magnitude growth. In this context, they do not have a foundation that gives them the agility to overcome the unexpected and innovate in new ways. On the other hand, I've spoken with customers who are growing in these challenging times. They can scale seamlessly to keep up with the unexpected surge in demand. They can build new customer experiences quickly. What is common across customers who are growing is the strong data foundations they have in place. These customers saw an opportunity before others and didn't let familiarity become a blind spot that stifles innovation. And as a result, they're overcoming the unexpected and innovating in new ways. Also, this is why over the past few years, we've seen so many customers migrate to the cloud at an accelerated rate. As Andy mentioned in his keynote, loads of databases have moved to AWS. And it's not just that we've seen over 350,000 databases that have migrated to the cloud. The rate at which customers are migrating every year continues to increase. And while many customers have migrated over already, there are many more customers that I've met with who want to reduce the time it takes to move over. Specifically, they want to reduce the time it takes to move from commercial systems to open source. Let's take a closer look at the challenges in migrating from commercial to open source. Consider a customer who has a SQL Server application natively speaking to a SQL Server and wants to move to Aurora Postgres. Today, when customers migrate their databases, they can automate a significant portion of their migration using AWS Schema Conversion Tool, or SCT, to migrate their database schema and the AWS Database Migration Service, or DMS, to migrate their data over with minimal downtime. But then, there's still more work to do when migrating the application itself and having to rewrite all that legacy T-SQL into PostgreSQL and switching out client drivers, which can be tedious and time consuming. When I talk to customers, this is the place where they need help. Let's take a closer look at the application problem. In this example, let's consider the basics. I have T-SQL in my application that creates a product table with a corresponding schema. In this context, let's say I'm using the money data type. In SQL Server, the money data type's behavior is fixed using four digits to the right of the decimal, which is the rounding precision that the application expects. That level of precision can be important when you think about discounts and taxation at scale. Now, if I insert some data into this table, you'll see that I have one product, it's coffee, and the price is 12.8182. With that, let's now look at application correctness. Let me show you the example of an application correctness problem a developer would have to deal with when moving from SQL Server to Postgres. On the left-hand side is an example of T-SQL application syntax, and on the right-hand side is an example of Postgres application syntax. Notice that the SQL statements are almost identical, whereas the identifiers of the product table are slightly different. When I execute these queries, let's take a closer look at the result. Do you notice 
the price difference? That is because in Postgres, the money data type is fixed using two digits to the right of the decimal. In this case, you see 12.82. And this subtle difference could result in a rounding error and break an application if not correctly addressed. So you can see that migrating your database code in your application may not always be straightforward. Rewriting your SQL queries and retesting your application can take time. And that is why many of you have been asking for a way to make this easier. Imagine a situation where you have a SQL Server-based application that contains T-SQL and connects to SQL Server with your favorite client driver speaking over TDS, which is SQL Server's wire protocol. And you want to shorten the amount of time it takes to move over to Aurora Postgres. Let's move that SQL Server application stack over to the side for a moment. Now let's suppose you turn on Babelfish, a new capability in Aurora Postgres, which exposes a TDS endpoint for your SQL application to connect to. Let's bring that SQL application back into the picture and connect it to that Aurora TDS endpoint. Now, your legacy application code remains written for SQL Server and your client drivers do not need to be changed because Aurora now understands both T-SQL and PostgreSQL. And not only does it understand the T-SQL dialect, it also understands how to return the correct value for unique data types like the money data type example we just saw. And any new application code can be written to Postgres running side by side with your legacy T-SQL. So let me invite Tobias Turnstrom to show us a demo of this in action. Thank you, Sean. Super excited to get you show you this. Before I get started, just want to mention one of the things that we hear a lot from customers as they transition databases is, you know, switching database drivers is hard, rewriting code is hard, but also switching tooling is hard. So throughout the demo, I'll stick with Microsoft tooling uh, across the board. Okay, let's take Babelfish for PostgreSQL out for a spin. So first of all, I'm here in SQL Server Management Studio or SSMS, where a lot of SQL Server developers like to, uh, to do their work. And let's start with just checking where we're actually at by running the at at version function. And we can see we're not actually connected to SQL Server, we're connected to an Aurora PostgreSQL instance, but clearly it speaks SQL Server, right? TDS and T-SQL, uh, since SSMS can connect and, and run against it. And note, I haven't installed anything specific on my, my client machine. It runs just native uh, drivers, uh, Microsoft tooling, etc. Okay, let's first of all create uh, just a table with and insert some rows here. So I have a products table, uses identity, you know, SQL servers, auto numbering feature, it has a name and a price. And the price, we use the money data type like Sean showed earlier. So I'll create the table. And then let's go and insert a couple of products. And these are you know, fitting products with our demo. It's uh, Babelfish, obviously, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Towels are critical for hitchhikers. We have a pan galactic gargle blaster, Vogan poetry you can get for cheap, etc. So I'll go and insert these rows. Cool. So now they're there. Let's now try and execute this against my Aurora PostgreSQL instance, but let's use PostgreSQL tooling instead. And sticking with Microsoft tooling, I'm going to use Azure Data Studio for this. So we'll open Azure Data Studio here. And why don't I just take SSMS and have it on the right hand side of the screen, like such. And I already have my Aurora PostgreSQL instance set up here, open databases, and we're going to use the same database here. So I'll right click new query. And then let's shut this connections dialog. And uh, first of all, we can see down here, you can see it says PostgreSQL. So we're connected against the PostgreSQL instance, as far as the tool knows. Um, 
and let's just do select version here, which is you know the similar function to at that version, but on the PostgreSQL side. And we see that this particular instance is running PostgreSQL 11.9. So again, both of these tools are now connected to the same underlying database. So let's see if we can see that table I just created here. So select star from products. And we can see the table here. Now scroll to the right. You can see that we have four uh, digits uh, precision here for the money data type. And I know Sean talked about the money data type in Postgres is two digit precision. But in fact, we're not using Postgres built in money data type. We're using a money data type that we added um, to be compatible with SQL Server. So that data type, though, obviously works also on the Postgres SQL side. So let's try some you know, Postgres SQL specific syntax. So let me do. Yeah, let's do order by price and limit five, for example, here. So we'll get the you know five lowest cost products. Awesome. So that's the Pangalactic Gargle Blaster and Vogue and Poetry. And then let's do the same thing on the SQL Server side, but there let's use top instead. So I'll say top five. Need the semicolon, I guess. But and there we go. We get the same result back. Okay, cool. So that's that's pretty nice. Um, what else can we do here? Can we do SQL Server Store procedures, triggers, other sorts of things? And yeah, absolutely. So I have a little very simple trigger prepped here. So let's go ahead and create it. And you can see the trigger doesn't really do much. It's on the products table. It's executed after update. Uh, set no count on is a SQL Server thing that just makes it not return the number of rows affected in messages back to the client. It's, it's commonly used in triggers. And then I select from the products table and I just return all of the products that were actually updated. So I use the inserted table that's available in SQL Server triggers. So I'll go ahead and create this trigger. And then let's see if the trigger actually works. So I'll update the products table, set price tools price plus one and let's do it for Vogue and poetry which is product ID six and there we go we can now see the real return for the update because we created that trigger so the trigger executed and returned the Vogue and poetry and we can see that the price is now two Let, why don't we try and execute exactly that same update on the PostgreSQL side so we see if the trigger we created on the SQL server endpoint shows up as executed on the PostgreSQL endpoint and it does and now we're up to three so we see that Aurora PostgreSQL using Babelfish for PostgreSQL in this case is absolutely bilingual. I can connect to a SQL Server compatible endpoint or to the Postgres endpoint, and they all work against the same database. And if you created a trigger on one side, it's, it's running for the entire database. It's not just for one endpoint or anything like that. Cool. Okay, let's just try a final thing, which is obviously an app. So... I have a Visual Studio project here with a simple Windows Forms app. It's written in C Sharp. And we can see the, the app came up here. You can kind of guess what it does. We have a couple of text boxes here to what to connect to. So this is my Aurora PostgreSQL instance running Babelfish. And I have a refresh button that's presumably going to put something in this uh, data grid here. So let's take a look at the button. And we can see here, when I click the button, yeah, we open a connection to SQL Server, right? We use System Data, SQL Client, SQL Connection. So that's the san standard SQL Server, ADO.NET library. And we use a standard SQL Server connection string here. And you can see I'm just pasting in uh, the information from my text boxes here. So we open the connection. We then create a command and we're going to select from our products table that we just created. We're going to use uh, an execute a data reader. And then I create a data table and I load this data table from the reader. And then we have a data grid view here that we set the data source of that grid view to the data table. Okay, let's run the application. And there we go, it started. And then let's click refresh data. And there we go. We get exactly the same results as we got in SSMS and Azure Data Studio. Let me go back to SSMS here and let's just increase the price again 
uh, maybe for all products. So I'll just execute this update without the where clause. Okay, so we see all products were returned by the trigger and added one to the price. And then let's refresh here and we can see all of the prices were increased by one. So there you go. Uh, hopefully you got a sense of what you can do with Babelfish for PostgreSQL and that PostgreSQL now is, is truly bilingual. Thank you. Back to you, Sean. Babelfish is a new translation layer for Amazon Aurora Postgres that enables Aurora to understand queries from applications written for Microsoft SQL Server. With Babelfish, apps currently running on SQL Server can now run directly on Aurora Postgres with little to no code changes. Babelfish understands the SQL Server Wire Protocol and T-SQL, Microsoft SQL Server's query language, so you don't have to switch database drivers or rewrite all of your application queries. Once you're done with your application testing, you can shut down that SQL Server database and stop paying for the licenses you don't need. This can save months to years of time, typically spent updating legacy application code to work with a new database. With Babel, the customers and ISVs who had to suffer price increases for SQL Server because of arbitrary licensing changes can break free and enjoy all the benefits of an open source world. But we didn't stop there. As we were preparing for reInvent, we got more and more feedback from customers on how desperate they were to move away from SQL Server and how excited they were about Babelfish. And a lot of them wanted to be able also to make their own modifications and extensions to this translation layer. So we decided to make Babelfish for PostgreSQL an open source project that makes the source code for this translation layer available to anyone who wants to customize it and add new features. All of the work and planning will happen on GitHub so that you get complete transparency into what specific SQL Server functionality we're working on next. If you want to add in your own modifications, you can do that as well. This project will use the permissive Apache 2.0 license, so you can use it for any purpose. Distribute it, modify it, and distribute modified versions of the software under the terms of the license. Customers can sign up for the Babelfish for Aurora Postgres preview today, and Babelfish for Postgres open source project will be available next year. With some great innovations in place to help with migrations, let's switch gears and talk about what we've learned from early builders in the cloud. Early cloud builders race to build new experiences for us. We know these experiences as watching streaming movies, staying connected with friends, planning an unforgettable trip to a unique home, or ordering a rideshare. These builders faced a completely different set of requirements than previous generations. Let it be trying to understand scale and performance when millions of users decide to watch a movie or order a rideshare or take a selfie and expect ultra low latency. They were hyper-focused on ensuring the right data foundation so they could best overcome the unexpected and continue to innovate in new ways. With that, the single most important thing we learned is one size fits nothing at all. The idea of a single database management system that can optimally handle every single workload, access pattern, and storage needs is a thing of the past. This is not the world we live in today. The world we live in today is fully managed APIs in front of purpose-built databases. A key to a proper data foundation is letting developers do what they do best, break complex apps that used to be developed as a single monolith into smaller pieces and picking the right tool for the right job. First, understand the use case, access pattern, performance and scale requirements, then pick the building block. AWS databases are purpose-built and optimized for your workloads. They're battle-tested, have high availability, performance, scalability, and security built right in. 
This might be best illustrated through the lens of a customer. Nike has been aggressively working towards cloud-native microservice architecture to enable speed, scale, and stability across the enterprise. Over the past five years, Nike reimagined its entire technology stack as part of a cloud acceleration strategy, prioritizing security, reliability, availability, and performance to innovate for its customers. Nike's engineers develop globally available cutting edge apps with a variety of purpose-built databases. They use DynamoDB to meet the scaling needs of high traffic product launches. And they built a social graph with Amazon Neptune to effectively map millions of relationships between world-class athletes and their followers. How can someone like Nike with the strong data foundation continue to innovate in new ways? Imagine if Nike wanted to easily connect product catalog data in DynamoDB with Elasticsearch to enable fuzzy search in their product catalog, basically to provide a great search experience for their customers. A fuzzy search is a process that locates items that are likely to be relevant for a search without needing an exact match, such as searching for Jordan running. How difficult would it be to build that into one of their applications? Some of the challenges we hear from customers is the complexity in building app code to help in the process of moving data between systems, for example, DynamoDB and Elasticsearch, in the related retry logic per error and associated pipeline management, customers asked us to make this easier for them to accomplish. When we got together on a whiteboard, what they would say to us is, why can't I quickly write a SQL-based query to combine and replicate data from multiple databases into something like a materialized view at a target system? And can the underlying system that performed this actively keep the data in the target up to date? And if there was a change to the data model in one of the source databases, it proactively alert developers so they can take action. And the system should be able to automatically scale its capacity as workloads go up and down. Let me invite Joseph Idzerick to show us a demo of this in action. Thank you, Sean. Let's continue to use Nike's application as an example. What I'm gonna show you is how easy it is to take a product catalog that's in DynamoDB, which is a really common customer use case for, for DynamoDB, and materialize that product catalog in an Amazon Elasticsearch service index to provide a really great search experience I think we've all kind of known to come and expect and love from the applications that we use. So to do this, what I'm first gonna show you is my product catalog in DynamoDB. Because I'm a huge basketball fan, my product catalog contains a few entries of some of the best Jordan sneakers of all time. Next, let me go into the Elastic Views console and show you how easy it is to create a view on top of my DynamoDB table and then materialize that view in a search index. I've already created my product catalog as a table. I'll call this product shoes table. What I want to do next is I want to create a view over this table. And a view is just simply a named query. So I'm going to call this sneaker view. And for this view, I'm going to actually select using a familiar particle uh, SQL language, I'm going to actually select all the attributes from my DynamoDB table. I could filter this down, but I want to have a really rich search experience. So I want to bring all of them over and materialize um, all of those attributes in my search index. So then I'm going to click create view. Now with this view, I'm going to next materialize this view into a search index. So I'm going to click materialize view. I'm going to add a target and I'm going to add in the ARN for my domain. And I'm going to call this sneaker index. And then I'm going to add this target and then materialize my view. What this is actually doing is now taking the data from my DynamoDB table and then using that view, that named query that I created, and then uh, now writing that data to my Amazon Elasticsearch service index. So if I go and click on this view, I can now see my end-to-end -end pipeline.
Now that my view has materialized, I should be able to go now and query my search index and be able to look for and, and search for products as if I was a customer. So let me add in the search query and I want to look for, let's say, uh, you know, Jordans that were, you know, that Michael wore in the movie Space Jam. So I'll type in Space Jam and I'll spell jam wrong. I'll spell it J-M-E because this is the beauty of full text search and this is why we want this data in Amazon Elastic Search Service. So I'll hit enter and it'll come back and bring me back the the Air Jordan Retro 11s, right? And these are the ones that Jordan wore during the filming of the Space Jam movie. So then I'll be able to display these results to my customer. So what happens now when I add a new item into my DynamoDB table that I created the view on? So let's go ahead and add in a new item. And I'm gonna add in a new pair of Jordan sneakers. These are the Jordan Air 12s, and these are the shoes that were famous for the flu game. Turned out uh, he didn't have the flu, it was just bad pizza. So I'm going to insert this into my DynamoDB table. And because we're materializing a view with Elastic Views, I'm gonna expect now that any updates to my DynamoDB table are gonna be reflected into my search index. So now let me go back to my search index and I'm gonna type in a query for flu, uh, salt, and then lake. Just to represent, you know, maybe that's all the information I had to go on was the flu game in Salt Lake. And I'm gonna hit enter. And there we go, the index or the item that I just added, the Air Jordan 12s are now materialized in my search index. So using Elastic Views, what I just did was I created a view over my DynamoDB table and then I materialized that into uh, an Amazon Elastic Search Service index. So not only did it bring over the items that were originally in my DynamoDB table, but it'll keep my index up to date. So any of my changes to my product catalog will be reflected into my search index. And with that, I can bribe my customers with a really great search experience, but also a really fast uh, experience for being able to deliver a product catalog in DynamoDB. Thank you, Joe. So Glue Elastic Views lets you use SQL to quickly create a virtual table called a materialized view of the data you want to combine from different data stores. Based on the materialized view definition, Elastic Views copies data from each source database to a target database and automatically keeps the data in the target database up to date. It continually monitors the source database for changes and updates the target database within seconds. If there is a change to the data model in one of the source databases, it proactively alerts developers so they can update their view to adapt to this change. If they want to copy operational data from an operational database to their data lake, such as S3, to run analytics in near real time, it does that too. And it automatically scales its capacity as workloads go up and down. It takes away all the muck of trying to do this yourself and reduces the time it takes to do this from months to minutes. And we're excited to give it to customers to use. Let's transition to the final chapter of today's talk. Whatever the industry, organizations are looking to become more agile so they can innovate and respond to change faster. Organizations need to build applications faster than ever with the ability to scale quickly to potentially millions of users, have global availability, manage petabytes if not exabytes of data, and respond in milliseconds. We call these modern applications. And they cover use cases from web and mobile backends, IoT applications, AI ML workloads, batch processing, shared service platforms, microservice backends, and more. Modern applications are built with a combination of modular architecture patterns, serverless operational models, and agile developer processes. And they allow organizations to innovate faster while reducing risk, time to market, and total cost of ownership. When we sit down and talk to customers about their needs as we advance into this modern application world, this is what we often hear. We hear things like, 
We don't want to worry about infrastructure. We need to innovate as fast as we can. We're not really great at plumbing. We need to outbuild the competition. And one of my favorites, we need to eliminate the need for everything but the code rewrite for our business. For some, this may sound familiar. Now let's talk about building and running applications without thinking about servers. Serverless is a way to describe the services, practices, and strategies that enable you to build more agile applications so you can innovate and respond to change faster. With serverless computing, infrastructure management tasks like capacity provisioning and patching are handled by AWS. So you can focus on only writing code that serves your customers. Serverless database workloads may start with infrequently used applications, dev test workloads, and mature to needing higher performance, higher availability, and rapid incremental scale. We see customers embracing serverless architectures as a standard within their organizations because it eliminates operational overhead. They can move from idea to market faster. It lowers costs, adapts at scale, and they can build better applications easier. Let me invite Joseph back to show us a demo of this in action. Thank you, Sean. Let's go back to our shoe example. Imagine if Nike created a flash sale for a bunch of retro Jordans. You know those Jordans are gonna sell out almost immediately. In this demo, I'm gonna show you the power of Aurora Serverless V2. What you're seeing is a CloudWatch dashboard for my steady state workload from my online shoe store that is depicted by two measurements. The orange line measured on the right hand axis is database capacity, which is measured in Aurora capacity units or ACUs, which is a measurement of compute resources like CPU and memory. The blue line measured on the left hand axis is customer orders which are composed of multiple actions in the database like checking for inventory, processing the new order, and updating the stock. My store is processing 10 orders per second and utilizing four ACUs. Now, to simulate a flash sale, I'm going to use Artillery, which is an open source load testing tool. What Artillery is going to do is spin up a bunch of Lambda functions that will process customer orders. Every 10 seconds or so, a new group of orders are being simulated, and here, a launch scenario represents a single customer. Now, true to how customers show up and place orders at a flash sale, I expect a quick increase in orders as people learn about the sale, but also some variation over time as well. After I sell out of the product for my sale, I expect the orders to go back to what they were doing before and go back to steady state. For this demo, I chose to store my product catalog and orders table in Aurora MySQL because that's the database I'm most familiar with and it's the database that's ultimately going to enable me to be the most productive and iterate quickly. This is the beauty of having multiple fully managed database options. As a developer, I have the choice to pick the best database for the job and the one that will ultimately make me successful. Now, if you look at my workload, as, as people start to learn about this flash sale, New orders, which is the blue line, are going to continue to increase um, over time. What I'm going to show you in the flash sale demo is the new scaling capabilities in Aurora Serverless V2. Now, using the RDS console, I've already provisioned an endpoint for Aurora Serverless V2. I'll spare you all the details on that one. That's not really the fun part. The fun part is seeing the serverless relational database in action reacting in real time to my flash sale workload. Let's speed this up. As you are seeing, Aurora Serverless V2 scales ACUs, the orange line, instantly to react to customer workload, again, the blue line. From an application developer perspective, and in the true spirit of serverless, I don't wanna to have to manage database capacity. I just want the database to scale to my customer's workload automatically. My compute is serverless because I'm using Lambda, which reacts in fine grain increments. And now my relational database is serverless and also reacts in fine grain increments too. Zooming in, you can see that the workload increases in the early part of my sale and the database is scaling instantaneously with customer orders. Now let's zoom back out and let's fast forward to the end of the sale. As you can see, people were pretty interested in buying the retro Jordans, no real surprise there whatsoever. 
and there's a lot of variation in my workload, which was expected as people started to learn about the sale. As orders peaked at approximately 275 per second, you can see that the database automatically scaled up to somewhere near 22 ACUs. The sharp spikes in the graph are a result of an increase in orders from the flash sale. Orders are a CPU intensive activity in the database. Again, an ACU or an Aurora capacity unit includes resources like CPU and memory. For CPU intensive tasks, the scaling up or down of ACUs happens instantaneously. However, you will notice at the end of the sale, the scaling down of ACUs is more gradual. Because ACUs are also a function of how much memory the database uses, we want to be careful about how much memory we release to avoid impacting your workload, thus a slower ramp down after the sale is over. There you have it, a serverless relational database that adjusts capacity in fine grain increments to provide just the right amount of database resources to support unpredictable and quickly increasing workloads like a flash sale for some retro Jordans. There is no database capacity to manage and you only pay for the capacity that your application uses. The nice thing is that Aurora Serverless V2 supports the full breadth of Aurora features, including global database, multi-AZ deployments, read replicas, and much, much more. All right, Sean, back to you. Aurora Serverless V2 can scale database workloads from hundreds to hundreds of thousands of transactions in a fraction of a second. Instead of doubling capacity every time a database workload needs to scale, Aurora Serverless V2 adjusts capacity in fine-grained increments to provide just the right amount of database resources that the application needs. Customers only pay for the capacity they consume and can save up to 90% of their database cost when compared to the cost of provisioning capacity for peak load. Aurora Serverless V2 also provides the full breadth of Aurora's capabilities, including multi-AZ support, global database that allows a single Aurora database to span multiple AWS regions for lower latency, backtrack, essentially an undo button for DBAs to reset or rewind Aurora to a specific point in time, and parallel query, fast analytic queries against data in Aurora. Aurora Serverless is now ideal for a much broader set of applications. Aurora Serverless V2 is available in preview today with the MySQL compatible edition of Amazon Aurora, and Postgres will be available in preview early next year. As I started with today, I believe every customer can use data to build a foundation for future innovation. AWS databases are purpose-built and optimized for your workloads. They're battle-tested, have high availability, performance, scalability, and security built right in. Our data strategy is simple. We provide best-of-breed APIs in each category. Our systems are designed for the cloud, meaning you get the full power of the cloud along with world-class operations. And with the most complete family of purpose-built databases, you can build a strong data foundation to overcome the unexpected and innovate in new ways. Thank you.